All right. So oil prices are usually pretty fragile because one disruption mess, messes up the whole system. It's not elastic like other things. I remember that from kind of Econ 102 back in college. And it doesn't help that most oil in the world is located in a sketchy place, as you alluded to earlier. By, by the way, I always meant to ask you this. Is, is that a coincidence or does having large amounts of commodities in your area just cause governments to focus on extraction <laughs> to the detriment of literally everything else in their well, nation? It depends and upon what else you have. So if you look yeah. at the Middle East, you're talking about an area where the, their biggest industries were pearling, frankincense and fishing. <laughs> And in desert communities, pre-industrial, you're talking about very small numbers of people. And then you stick a straw in the desert and you get oil. And obviously you're gonna focus on that. So you get the, the Dutch disease, if you will. Uh, in comparison, uh, Norway was an advanced technocratic society with basic manufacturing and hydropower and nickel processing before they discovered oil. Or look at Texas. It was one of the world's largest economies. If, if it had been an independent country, it would have been a trillion dollar economy before the shale revolution. So when you have crude, it doesn't necessarily make you a failed state. It depends upon what was there before. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I, cause I just, look, cor correlation isn't causation and all that, but I look but at some of these places. there is a correlation, and, yes. Yeah, and I go, good God, what, did this, what happened to this place? Or what is going on here? Uh, speaking of disasters, what about getting Venezuela back online? I know Biden was trying to do that. I mean, I have concerns, I assume you do as well. Well, let's start with what Biden was doing. He was basically saying that Venezuela, the state, owes a lot of entities in the United States, not just in the petroleum sector, a lot of entities, a lot of money. So we will loosen the sanctions a little bit so that the crude that you produce can be sold and you never see that money. Ah, that okay. money goes to the American firms that you owe money to. And if you can keep this up and not be a jerk about it, then a year from now, when you've paid off those debts, we will then begin a more serious conversation about the broader environment. So it's an if, 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 then. So, I mean, do I think that Maduro is a great governor? No. Do I think he's the kind of person that should be allowed to be in, in control of Venezuela for the long run? Not really. I'd argue that maybe we're not the people to make that decision. That should be the Venezuelans. But we're just, we're setting the stage for theoretically what comes next. And if Maduro decides to go back to his old habits, then this dissolves in a day and it's no harm to us. Right, because we got the oil and then the money or whatever we needed out or, of the I mean, the if it arrangement. stops tomorrow, we're not in any worse place than we were the day before. I suppose that's true. Yeah. Now, if your goal is to actually get Venezuela back to its peak of producing three to five million barrels a day, that's a different conversation because we have had full-on state collapse complete with famine across the Venezuelan space. And this isn't Saudi Arabia where it's an easy field close to the coast. You've got a line of coastal mountains, then you've got your population belt and your oils below that. So if you want to resurrect Venezuela, you need to send in at least 50,000 troops and physically rebuild the country from the ground up over the course Oof. of a decade. And then you have the, um, the option of spending two to $300 billion to resurrect the world's most complicated oil production system. And you will not get your first oil. And if you start today, you will not get your first oil most likely until at least 2035. That's insane. So that sounds hopeless for that. Well, it's not something we are interested in. Yeah. But if you fast forward a year or two and the Middle East is being the Middle East again and the Russian oil is gone, and the Americans have basically built a little wall around their own energy markets, then you're gonna have global energy prices that on a cheap day are looking like 150 and are typically over 200. And in that sort of environment- Dollars per barrel, yeah. yeah. And wow. in that sort of environment, the Europeans are like, huh, hey, Washington, would you, would you mind if we colonized Venezuela? What, what sort of deal can we strike that you'll just let that happen? And you say colonize, but it's not really a joke because it's almost like that's what has to happen. Countries that, with I mean, large oil that's markets. That's the scale of what has to happen here. And keep in mind that this is not the 1800s when the Europeans had the gun and everyone else had spears. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hugo Chavez, Oof. one of his last big acts before he died is he distributed 150,000 AK-47s to the population. So anyone who thinks that this is going to be easy is wrong in every possible way. Oh my gosh, it, it, it's just, it does sound like recolonialization where countries with large oil markets have to secure their own supply from another place that can export it, but they don't have the security to do it themselves.
Libya, so, Algeria, probably also part of this problem or same situation. Uh, I mean. Libya has a similar situation of populations on the coast. The infrastructure runs through the populated areas, but the oil is deep in the desert. Now, because it's not tropics, because there aren't a lot of mountains, because the population is so much smaller, it would be easier. But the only country that I think is likely to consider that would be Italy. And I don't know how well you know your colonial history, but every time that Italy has tried to have a colony in the last 300 years, it's been a shit show. And I don't have any reason to expect it would be any. Yeah, I, I don't think, yeah, we don't have any reason to expect that it would be any different uh, this time around. It's, I mean, just given, yeah, it, it, Italy's another fun place to watch because it just go, you just go, wait a minute, wh really? Is this, the, is this real news? I can't believe it. Okay, <laughs> well, but and I it's, guess. And it's crazy because yeah. the northern third of Italy where the half the population lives, that's more technologically advanced than Japan. In, in, in output per hour worked, it's more productive than Northern Germany. That's shocking, but, actually. But Just knowing Italy. my Italian friends who live <laughs> yep. in Italy still, yeah, that's, yep. they must not live in that part of Italy. <laughs> or, or maybe they do, but they're just dragged down by the rest. You know, the yeah. southern half is, is a bit of, of a crazy. But in order to make that northern third work, they have to have access to, to gobs of energy. So they actually have a pretty sophisticated energy system. They can take any flavor of crude and mix it to make uh, something that any of the refineries can run. One of the few places in the world that can do that. But they have to still be able to source the crude. And in a post-American deglobalized world, that becomes a big problem. Italy's right next door. I'm sorry, Libya. Is right next door. Libya is right next door. Yeah, indeed. But okay, I know people are going to go. This is why we need green energy to replace oil. Can that actually happen? I'm a layman. It doesn't sound like it's right around the corner. Well, the idea is really sexy, right? Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, if, if you can get enough copper and zinc and everything else, then you can basically declare independence from petroleum, and that sounds great. But making electricity is a lot more sophisticated than an internal combustion engine. I mean, internal combustion engine, I'm oversimplifying here. Uh, you light a match, you burn something, you capture the heat, you go. That, that, that's what it is, basically. Uh, if you want an electricity storage system and transmission system, you need an order of magnitude, more machinery, more materials, and more different kinds of materials. You need your cobalt, you need your lithium, your copper, your zinc, and all the rest. And that means that you may, if you're successful, be able to declare independence from a world dominated by Venezuela, Iran, Iraq, and Russia. But it now means that you have to be inextricably linked to Canada and Mexico and Bolivia and Chile and Brazil and Argentina and Peru and Vietnam and Indonesia and Malaysia and Australia and Pakistan and India and China <laughs> and Kazakhstan and Mongolia and Turkey and Algeria and, oh yeah, still Russia. Because so, of rare earth metals and stuff like that? Well, is that why? That's not, I mean, rare earth is like one of the few things that we actually have covered. You need at least five times as much of all of these materials as the globe produces right now to make the green transition work. It's a lot of copper. And we just don't have production capacity necessary to support this on a global scale. And we're losing the Russian stuff. And very soon we're going to lose the Chinese processing capability. So if you're going to apply these technologies, you are only going to apply them in places where, so a good solar belt, a good wind belt, that's the American Southwest, but there are not a lot of places where people live, locations. Right, and you can't just transport me with a bajillion miles of lines, it has to yeah. sort of... There's no permitting problem, a thousand <laughs> miles is reasons that you can ship power. Well, and, and I probably should do a whole show on this because that seems like okay fine don't worry about the wind don't worry about the sun new uh nuclear's great there's just two problems disposal of the spent fuel that's actually the easiest problem yeah but it's, nobody wants a nuclear um problem number two is time relations assuming that you could just build it how whatever you wanted work years from the point that you put oh, your first money wow. in that's that's a pretty long delta yeah and then third uh <laughs> is kazakhstan Okay. And most uh -huh, we're of still what tied is produced Russia. in Kazakhstan in Russia in just fuel rods. Can't do this without the Russians at scale. Okay. So l let's say we fig provided we figure out how to generate the power and sort of give it up on that. <laughs> but what about batteries, right? Are we just oil issues for rare earth metal and other issues? Uh, aren't an issue. Uh, okay, rare earth gotcha. production is a byproduct of a processing issue. And most of that is done in China because it's expensive. It's just people, the, the Chinese have subsidized the finished product for a low cost. Got it. And it's like, it from the Chinese at a third of what it would cost you to do it yourself. Uh, but 10 years ago, when they uh, tried to access, everyone went out and built out the processing 1920s technology. It's not hard. It's not even expensive. Ah. It's done. 
So if China were to like fall in on itself, we'd probably have about six months that it would take to spin all this infrastructure already been paid for. So we'd be okay with rare earth, copper and lithium. Uh, and getting the world's lithium comes from Chile and they're continuing to produce more and more and more. Copper is primarily Chile again uh, and Russia. Uh, so and Indonesia. Yes. So that the Russian stuff is going away. Uh, we don't have enough of either of those to maintain a moderate green build out in the United States, much less global at scale. Now, in a post globalized system where Chile and Australia are part of the American network, that gives us some opportunities that other countries don't have. You take their production, you concentrate it into the Western Hemisphere for sales. That just might work in places where this makes sense. Uh, but everywhere else, there's just not enough.